It's time for our evening worship service to begin. We appreciate your attendance here this evening. I'm glad that you made it back for the evening worship service. We welcome you to be here, especially you that are visiting with us. We deeply appreciate you being with us to visit. We invite you to come and be with us any opportunity you have. Uh, if you were here this morning, you heard me talk about the family that has been visiting with us and identified with us and want to make this their home congregation, Tom and Allison Wade, and daughter Allie, Allie Mann, placed membership with us here. And then there's two more in the family, Emily Mann, who is 12, seventh grader at, uh, seventh grader this fall, and Zoe, three-year-old, Allie being a, Allie being a freshman this fall at Northeast. I'm going to share this a little more with you. I think you'll find this interesting. Tom's grandfather was named E.W. Wade. Some of y'all might recognize that name, know who it is. But he was the man who started the children's home named Pineville. It just so happens, I know where it originally was because I went to school to the hog cut and it was in that community. And I made the mistake of asking uh, Tom, uh, what, the, what was the name of it when they started? He told me Pineville. Well, if I'd have thought a little bit, I would have known because it was in a place where there was a lot of pines. So they had a good name for it. So then when the waterway came through, that's when they had to move. So I found that interesting. And I got to mention one thing about Allison. She's a school teacher. I appreciate that. I know y'all do. I meant to get the information on the number of school teachers that was short in the state this last year. You, you wouldn't believe it. So I appreciate a school teacher. Let's join in now in our worship service.
Let us pray. Hey, Father, thank you for staying. Thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for this day we have here to worship you. And uh, may we take what we learned this morning and what we're going to learn tonight and use it in everyday lives throughout the week. Be the ones that's on a sick list. Psalm before our scripture reading this evening, number 539. Sing the first and fourth verse. Will you please stand as we sing this song? <clears throat> I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher Good evening. Join Larry and welcome you here this evening and thank you for being part of our service. I hope that your day has been a good one and hope that uh, it continues to be so as we study from God's Word. If you've been following along with our Old Testament reading, our Old Testament studies <coughs> on Sunday night primarily, we have gotten now to the book of 1 Kings. Tonight I want us to talk about a fellow by the name of Solomon. Now, a little participation tonight. Show of hands. How many of you here think Solomon was wise? All right, some. How many of you think Solomon was foolish? Okay. How many think Solomon was some of both? Yeah, that got just about everybody. That's kind of what we want to talk about tonight is, is the idea of Solomon... Uh, really being a lot like all of us. Now, he was probably wiser than a lot of us. I don't know about foolish. Solomon was one of those characters that we read about in the Bible that is a lot like other characters we read about in the Bible. They had their good things and their bad things. They had their, their good characteristics and their bad characteristics. They had things that they did very well, and they, they had things they didn't do so well. So we're going to look primarily tonight at 1 Kings chapter 3. It may reference to some other verses that I hope that you'll turn to and read, but uh, this particular passage in 1 Kings 3 gives us a, a pretty good indication, gives us at least an example of some of the things that we find out about with Solomon. Now, now Solomon is, is primarily known for three things. Uh, primarily, he is known for the one, of course, that built the temple. Uh, much of Scripture, a lot of the Scripture is devoted to this and some of the things that went into that. He is known, of course, as a very wealthy king. Now, a lot of this wealth he inherited, you might say, from David. But nevertheless, he was known as one of the kings with some of the greatest wealth that he was able to, to gather in. And then the third thing, of course, is he's kind of known for his, for his wisdom, being a wise king. One of the, 
The principal stories that we go to for this is in the second part of this chapter. If you've got your Bibles, turn there to 1 Kings, 1 Kings 3. You have an example of, of his wisdom, a story beginning in verse 16. Uh, one that uh, we, we hear growing up, we teach our kids sometime in explaining wisdom. And, and basically you can summarize the story this way. There were two women that both had children very close together within a few days of each other. They were in the same house. On one particular night, one of the women's, uh, ch her child died. Uh, the other one said that she lay on it and it died. Well, this woman then went and swapped babies, if you will. Took the, her dead child to this one and brought the living one back to her. When the woman awoke the next morning, uh, she saw that the child that she had was dead. But when she began to look at it closely, she realized this isn't really my child. And so they both claimed that the living one was theirs. And they come to Solomon and said... Tell us about this. What, you know, what, what can you do? Uh, we both claim that this living child belongs to us. And in a display of wisdom, Solomon said, bring me a sword. Once they brought the sword, he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to divide this living child in half, and each of you can have a half. Knowing, of course, that the mother whose child it really was that was still alive, would not allow this to happen. And of course, she did not do so. She said, no, I would rather sh my child be alive with her than be killed. And of course, the other, the other mother wasn't, didn't have that attitude. And so Solomon knew uh, who's, who's the child who it belonged to. So uh, an example there of wisdom. But when you, you go through Solomon's life, you, you see sometimes that he displayed great wisdom such as this. But you also see sometimes that he, he displayed great foolishness. And so tonight, uh, when we ask the question, is he wise or foolish? Really what we're going to talk about is the fact that he was wise and foolish. That he was both and, it wasn't either or. That some of Solomon's wisdom, some of his uh, attributes, some of his character, some of the things that he did were wonderful. They were great. A great example for us to follow. But on the other hand, some of his things were about his foolish as they could be. Aren't we the same way? Aren't we wise and foolish? Don't we have our moments in our Christianity when we make some really good decisions? And we have to think, I think God would be proud of me in the way that I relied on my faith, the way that I trusted in Him, the way that I believed in Him and He saw me through. But on the other hand, don't we also have times in our lives where we make very foolish decisions. And looking back, we go, I know God must have been disappointed. I know now that that was a very foolish decision. I know that it wasn't wise. I know that what I did wasn't the right thing to do. But then, even in life, in life in general, we have some foolish things that we do. I, these are a, a few of my favorites. Uh, one, one thing here... Uh, someone said, I took an IQ test and the results were negative. Uh, sometimes I felt that way. Sometimes some of the mistakes that I made, sometimes some of the things that have happened, you think, boy, I, I can't believe I would do something like that. Uh, here are some, some things that are put out there that, at least in my estimation, are pretty foolish. On a Fritos bag, it said this, you could be a winner, no purchase necessary. Details inside bag. Well, you let that sink in a little bit and figure out how you're going to be a winner with details in the bag and not purchase it. I guess you could open it there in the store. Uh, a clothes iron. This is one of my favorite. A clothes iron. Do not iron clothes on body. Now, the sad thing is, you know why that warning's there, right? Because somebody tried it. Probably a college student, but somebody tried it. You know, I, I remember college students, you, you, you get up and your clothes are, are wrinkled and you don't, have, you don't have time to iron, so you just wrinkle the part, you iron the part that's going to show, right? Children's cough medicine. Do not drive car or operate machinery after use. So children, you can drive a car and operate machinery anytime you want to, as long as you don't have cough medicine. But this is probably the best one. Some of you have asked about this big uh, scratch place on my face. 
Well, what happened is I really needed a good personal illustration for something foolish. And so I burnt my face. In all honesty, we had some boys over Friday night for Benjamin's birthday. And uh, as is the custom, when he has his friends over, they like to roast hot dogs and marshmallows and have s'mores. And we have these nice metal skewer things that, that we use that we've actually kept up with longer than we keep up with most stuff. And we wash them and clean them up and put them back up. And uh, I was attempting to... Uh, roast some, actually some sausage. We fed them hot dogs. Danielle gave me smoked sausage to fix for myself. Trying to do that, and it was dark. We, they didn't get back from the park till late, and it was dark. It was hard to see. And I couldn't tell if that sausage was done or not. And so in my attempt to not only see if it was done, but I also have figured out that when it's getting close to done, you can hear it sizzling real good, Right? So I put that stick up, I was going to get a good eye and I was going to get a good earful. And I heard sizzling, but it was my skin sizzling, not, not the sausage. And I thought, well, Greg, you wanted something to say that was foolish, you got it. Here's a personal illustration. We all do some crazy things, some foolish things. And I wish I could say that was the most foolish thing I've done in my life. Most painful I've had in a while. But tonight, let, let's look at Solomon Let's look at the good, let's look at the bad, let's learn lessons from both, and hopefully it will affect us, it will motivate us, it will help us in our goal to be abounding in the work of the Lord. That we'll look at mistakes that were made, but we'll also realize the good things that he did, some things that we can count on, some things that we can emulate to help us abound in the work of the Lord. He was really both. He had the great moments and the weak moments uh, someone said he was a smart person that was pretty dumb, and that's really what we get. Let's look at uh, the first 15 verses of 1 Kings chapter 3. We'll make some comments about this, and the lesson will be yours. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house in the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at the high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer uh, a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David my father. Because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and an uprightness of heart toward you. You have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen a great people. Too many to be numbered or counted for a multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies or but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days." And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. This is the beginning of an interesting story. And it would be nice to say that Solomon followed through on all of this and continued to walk in the statutes of the Lord, but as we have hinted at already, he simply did not do that. But let's look at the good first. Let's look at the wisdom of Solomon and uh, what we can find there. Uh, we know that he loved God. Verse 3 says that he walked in the statutes of his father David and he sought to please God. 
So there was this part of Solomon that was very much in tune with God's will and his love for God and wanted to follow in the footsteps of his father David. He realized his great spiritual heritage. Uh, he, he, in talking to God here in this dream, in this conversation, he talks about the fact that he knew that David had, had, had followed God and God had taken care of him. And there's a recognition here of what God had done in the past and also kind of some of this that, that Solomon had, had inherited. Uh, this realization that the, the faith that he had and, and his, his, his wisdom and his decisions, that, that some of that was because of his father David. He was thankful to God for what he had done. Verse 6 uh, talks about uh, his acknowledging God for what God had done, noting that God had done great things. Uh, he had showed mercy and kindness to David. He had made Solomon king, and, and Solomon you know, seems to hint out here, look, you didn't have to do this. You didn't have to make me king, but you chose me, and, and he was thankful for that. He humbled himself before God. Verses 7 and 8 talks about him being like a child and needing God's help. Uh, a characteristic and attribute all leaders need in the world today, not just in the religious sense, but, but everything, the, the humility. Now we know that, again, Solomon makes mistakes uh, as he goes along, but at this particular point, as he's making this request before God, it is one with great humility, an acknowledgement of how great God was, followed by an acknowledgement of how weak Solomon knew he was and how he needed God's help. The people are great. The people are large. I need your help, God. I am not worthy. I, I humble myself before you. Verse 9, he realized the power of prayer. He asked for something that many would not have asked for, something different. But he asked believing that God would give him what he asked. And he asked, understanding that God had the power to help him. Verse 9 says that this, this asking was asking wisely. What a compliment coming from God. The fact that he asked wisely. You see, he asked for what he needed with God's people to help him rule. He did not ask selfishly. In verse 10, we're told this pleased God. Now, think about that today. What about your prayer life? How many times do we find ourselves being pretty selfish? How many times do we find ourselves saying, God, give me things for me, for me, for me, instead of, God, give me something so that I can help someone else. Give me something so I can be a better person and in turn serve better people. He asked wisely, he came to the proper conclusion. If you go to the uh, end of the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says that he has concluded that what needed to happen, what was most important, was to fear God and keep His commandments. He knew that he needed God, and he realized that this happiness was found only in God. So if you look at some of these things and the way that he asked God and and the way that he humbled himself before God, and all of those things, again, those are things, those are things that we can look at and say we need to follow that example. So, think with me just for a moment. Do we have the wisdom of Solomon? Do we love God the way Solomon talks about loving God here? Do we recognize our spiritual heritage? We kind of get spoiled in this country, and especially in the South, because... We have such a great spiritual heritage and we just kind of take things for granted. I encourage you sometime to talk to folks that, that live in places in this country or out of this country where the Christians that gather are very few, where the church is very young. They don't have those years and years of spiritual heritage to build upon. Solomon recognized David and, and that heritage that he had. We need to consider and think about those that have gone before us and, and paved the way for us. We need to be thankful, like Solomon was, thankful to God for who He is, for what He's done. We need to be humble, like Solomon, realizing that compared to God, we're nothing. And we go to Him as little children, asking Him to help. We need to understand and realize the power of prayer, Solomon did, to ask things wisely, 
and to come to the proper conclusion that says we need to fear God and keep His commandments. But unfortunately for Solomon, that's not all that we know about him because we also know that he had some foolishness. One of the, the most foolish things or more foolish things that he did was his disobedience to God. Several uh, passages there are listed on your outline if you look at, if you look at those. I'm um, not going to turn and read all of those. I would encourage you to, to look those up. But basically, it, it's easy to summarize. You see, Solomon made an alliance with Egypt and other nations. Now in Exodus 34, 14 through 16, it's God there is giving instructions to the people. He specifically says, don't do this. It can't be any plainer. Don't do this. But in 1 Kings 3, 1, he did. So God says, don't do it. And Solomon did. Solomon was one that followed after other gods. Again, in Exodus 34, 14 through 16, God says, you're not to have any other gods before me. You're not supposed to do this. The first Kings 11, 1 through 13, that's exactly what Solomon did. You see, Solomon here at the beginning perhaps followed God and realized who God was, but sometime along the way he seemed to have forgotten because he explicitly did what God said not to do and making alliances with others, and bringing in more idols, and following after other gods. God said, don't do this, but he did. Solomon was also one that failed to heed the warnings that he was given. If you look in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 3, David is talking to Solomon here, and he says, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in His ways and keeping His statutes, His commandments, His rules, and His testimonies as is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. So here David is saying, this is what you need to do. You need to be faithful. You need to walk in the statutes. You need to keep doing uh, as God would have you do. And then if you look over a few pages earlier to, to 1 Kings uh, chapter 1, uh, David is also talking there about uh, things to be followed, obedience, and, and what it takes. And so there's a warning from David is what I'm trying to get out there. And then uh, also in 1 Kings three fourteen and then 9, 2 through 7, there are warnings from God. Uh, these warnings are much the same. Uh, you... We read one of them just a moment ago in verse 14 where he tells Solomon, you need to uh, walk in my statutes, keep my statutes, my commandments as your father David walked. I'll lengthen your days. Also in chapter 9, verses 2 through 7, same type of warning, same type of encouragement that says, Solomon, you do what is right. But Solomon didn't do that. He was, he was given the warning. He was given the instruction. He was given the commandment. But... Eventually, he decided that he was going to do what he wanted to do. You see, he was willing to compromise, doing just enough to get by. Really, we see a lot of division in Solomon. We talked about him being uh, wise and foolish. It's almost as if his heart was divided. It's almost as if one side really wanted to do what God wanted him to do, but the other did not. He kind of did, did only the minimum. Solomon was one that we can say began well, but he didn't finish well. You see, Solomon, as well as being known for his wealth and his wisdom, he's also known for the idolatry, for the foreign alliances, for the turning his back against God. He was one that began in a great way, but not so much at the end. We talked about him coming to the proper conclusion. But he came to the proper conclusion the wrong way. What we didn't say earlier about the book of Ecclesiastes is the reason Solomon had come to that conclusion is because he had tried everything else first. He turned his back on God. He had sought uh, wisdom from other things and other people, other places. He had sought happiness other ways. He, he had gone against God's desire for him in being a king. Yes, he finally realized that he needed to fear God and keep his commandments. 
But it took him a long way to get there. And he sinned a whole lot along the way. So, the question then comes, what about us? If we're honest with ourselves, do we find ourselves having the foolishness, foolishness of Solomon? Are we disobedient to God even when God has encouraged us, taught us about what we're supposed to do? Are we people that refuse to heed the warnings? You see, God throughout Scripture has warned us about what it means to do what is right and the consequences of doing what is wrong. God has warned us of the consequences of sin. How dangerous it is to disobey. He's told us of, of the danger of turning our back against Him. Of, of turning our humility into pride. He, he's warned us of the danger of, of sexual immorality. He, he's warned us of, of the danger of letting greed and pride get in our way. He's warned and He's warned and He's warned. And He said ultimately, there's going to be a, a reckoning, a judgment. A time is going to come when those who have heeded my warnings, those who have obeyed, those who have listened, they'll be ushered into eternal life in heaven. But for those of you that have disobeyed, those of you that have refused to heed the warnings, your destiny, your future is only eternity in hell. Are we like Solomon in that, that we, we're willing to compromise? Just, just do enough to get by or just do the things that we like, kind of a cafeteria style where we pick and choose what we want to do. Don't be like Solomon in that you don't finish well. Don't, don't find the conclusion the wrong way. If tonight you're on that, that journey and, and you realize your life isn't what it's supposed to be, you realize you can look and see the foolishness of disobeying God. The foolishness of waiting to get your life right. The foolishness of waiting to make that initial step, that first commitment that says, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower of God. I want to put off the old and take on the new. If you find yourself in the midst of, of the journey similar to Solomon, where you, you've tried all of these things to find happiness, you've, you've tried all of these things to, to find some sort of self-worth, Got news for you. You're not going to find it until you turn to God. God is the only one that can provide that. So if you find yourself on that journey, get off of that train tonight. Get off of that journey. Realize, as Solomon finally did, that what we need to do is fear God and keep His commandments. The question as we sing the song of encouragement is, are you wise or foolish? Are you wise or foolish? We've been saying this year that we want to abound in the work of the Lord. Been saying that we want to be the kind of people that are steadfast and movable. You can pick out parts of Solomon's life where he did this, but much of his life he wasn't steadfast and movable. It's really kind of a roller coaster type of, type of story. But if we want to abound in the work of the Lord, if we want to be steadfast, if we want to be immovable, if we want to have that kind of dedication, that kind of drive, that kind of motivation, then we've got to We've got to be wise. We've got to be wise. We've got to follow the things that Solomon did in his, in his love and his humility and, and all of those things. Tonight, will you demonstrate wisdom in following God and submitting to Him? If you're here tonight and we can help in any way, I invite you to come as we stand and as we sing together.
Thank you for being with us this afternoon. We're glad that you were here, and we especially want to welcome any visitors that we have with us tonight. We have several announcements before we close tonight. Uh, the congregation at Pickwick is having a gospel meeting this week. We will be uh, taking a bus over on Monday night. We'll leave from the annex at 6 o'clock. Uh, if you have one of the white logo shirts, please wear it. Golden Circle will have breakfast in the morning at Lloyd's Cafe in Corinth. We'll leave from the annex at 8.15. Uh, Joshua Hester uh, will be leaving tomorrow on a mission trip to New Zealand for three weeks. So we need to remember him uh, in our prayers this week. Family of Eloise Loveless uh, wants to invite everyone to the Berea Church of Christ next Sunday at 2 o'clock for a uh, birthday celebration uh, for, for Miss Eloise's 80th birthday. Everyone is invited to attend. In addition to those that are listed in the worship bulletin that are sick, Paula Warner's in local hospital, room 327. There are still places on the uh, list to help for Vacation Bible School, if you can help do that. Please remember the 7th through 12th graders will have a family fellowship tonight over at the West Side Community Park immediately after our service tonight. And the blood drive is tomorrow beginning at 4 o'clock in the TAC. Uh, if you're able to give blood, please sign up the, on the list in the foyer. If you did not have an opportunity to participate in the Lord's Supper this morning, uh, it will be served in the little chapel at the uh, back of the auditorium. You may pass at this time. Some before our closing prayer this evening, number 470. 470, we'll sing one verse. If you please stand, we'll sing a song. Remain standing. I heard no more story, I said it came from glory, I did on Calvary to save a rest like me. I heard about His holy, of His precious blood's atonement, and I repeat. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come to your house today to worship you. Pray we did it in spirit and truth. We thank you for the lessons that we heard. May we apply them to our, li our life. I pray you will be with us as we go through this week ahead and, and we'll make uh, you the center of our, our activities. Let us be an example to the one we come in contact with this week. I pray that we may continue to abound in the work of the Lord and just do the thing with a pleasing and pleasant attitude. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.